So welcome again. Let's do this. So we're working our way through the profound treasury of the ocean of Dharma, volume one. This is a um, compendium, actually a digest of um, 13 years worth of uh, transcripts. Every year, Trungpa Rinpoche took a group of students ranging from 100 to 300 or so, different sizes, and, to what, and away for three months at a time for what was called seminary. And um, roughly half that time was devoted to teaching and the other half was pure sitting um, when the teaching was happening, there was also sitting, but there was a lot of there were a lot of classes, and um, the all the talks that he gave were recorded and transcribed, and um, they have been published. They've been edited and digested by Judith Leaf, and published in three volumes as the Profound Treasury of the Ocean of Dharma. Vol volumes one. Uh, and two are what are called sutriyana teachings, meaning these are the Tibetan teachings are divided into three uh, levels, you might say. The first is called the Hinayana, which literally means the lesser vehicle. Yana means vehicle, uh, like a cart. And um, Trungpa Rinpoche preferred to call it the foundational vehicle. Um, the second one is the Mahayana, meaning the greater vehicle. And the third one is called the Vajrayana, uh, which can be variously translated as the diamond or indestructible uh, vehicle. And the Vajrayana is where Tantra uh, takes place. That's where the Tantric teachings are given. And they were held secret until just this digest was published. Trungpa Rinpoche specified that they were to remain closed to and only available to people who had been to seminary of one kind or another um, until some period after his death when they would be made available. And that period has come about. And now they're available in volume three of the Profound Treasury. Volume one is the Hinayana and volume two is the Mahayana. So we're st we have started to work our way through these. Uh, and we're on volume one, chapter nine, pages 75 to 79 <laughs> of about 500 and some odd pages in volume one. So this will be a, a delightfully slow process. <laughs> and uh, you're invited to read before you come. Uh, every week we send out an email telling you what, what's up for that week. And you can read the selection or you can just come and listen uh, to the talk. Um, the topic in, in chapter 9 is the structure of samsara. And last week we did the first part of the chapter and we talked about um, the 12 nidanas. These are so that are also called the 12 links of dependent co-origination. And you might say that they're kind of the 12 steps in which we create a fictional story about me starting um, with um, the creation of me, which is the act of ignorance and ignoring, and then developing on through uh, the proliferation of this act until finally uh, in the 12th link, we encounter death. And death is always a rebirth as well because every death is at the beginning of something else. Just like this, these words that are coming out of my mouth, they die and a space is born and a new word arises and so forth and dies. Same thing with everything. So last week we went through these 12 nadanas. Um, and since then I've uh, come across a reading that I'm going to recommend to you. Uh, the Dalai Lama uh, has a book, you know, someone made a book out of his talks 
called The Wheel of Life, which is what all this is about. And in that, on the first 24 pages or so, uh, he describes the 12 Nadanas and does it really beautifully, and I recommend that as a reading. Tonight, we're going to continue describing this wheel of life. This is a, a heuristic that you can, you would usually find at the entrance to almost any um, Tibetan temple and many other Buddhist temples and other traditions as well. It shows a demon uh, holding a wheel and he's got it in his arms and he's biting the top of it like this with fangs. That demon is Yama. He's the Lord of Death. But what he really represents is impermanence, transience, because all of confused life uh, is subject to birth and death. Only enlightened mind transcends birth and death. And so the wheel that he's holding is a diagram of confusion and how confusion works. It uh, consists of 21 parts, this diagram. And the outer ring uh, are the 12 nadanas, the 12 links of dependent co-origination, the 12 steps in the story of how I is born, develops, and dies, which happens every instant, happens over the course of a lifetime, there are many, many time frames, an infinite number of time frames for it. The, within that outer ring, the next ring in is divided into six parts. And these are called the six realms. So now we've got 18. And these I'm going to, are the topic for this evening, primarily. Within that, in the very center, is a ring um, that has two parts. On the right, it's dark, and you see beings sort of swimming down. And on the right, it's white, and you see beings swimming up. And what this is, is the circle of, um, you might say, good and bad karma. That when you commit evil deeds, uh, it takes you down in your existence and brings you down to unpleasant states. And when you commit virtuous deeds of one kind or another, you come up into happier states and you just go around and around this ring. And it shows a bunch of people doing that. It looks like they're swimming. So now we're up to, what, we're up to 20. And then in the very center is a circle. And inside that circle are a chicken, a pig, and a snake. And they represent the three poisons, uh, which are Indifference, often translated, it's the word is moha in Sanskrit, and it's often translated as ignorance, but that's a bad translation of it because ignorance is better applied to the fundamental problem uh, which plunges us from Buddhahood, the fundamental ignorance. And this is really indifference and passion and aggression. So I thought tonight I, what I would do is to put all this into context, is take you through a couple of different schemes. The first is um, the five skandhas. This is sort of a, a, a version of how the story of ego of this is told. Ego um, is this belief that we have that I exists. But in fact, all that I is is a story that we tell ourselves from time to time. And I is the hero or the heroine of that story. As soon as you stop thinking about the story, I dissolves and there's just this here, which is kind of what we were doing in meditation. Every time we come back to that open space, we see our thoughts, we let go, and we're just right here. And we let go of any notion of I until I arises again and we say, how am I doing? And we're back into a story about me. And I is always past and future oriented. And it's always about self-improvement and self-criticism in one way or another. But when we come back to simple awareness, then it dissolves. 
So the first um, beginning of, you might say, of the development of ego is the arising of I. And the way that happens is that it arises in dependence on an other. So suddenly there's Brendan. And that perception of this entity out there implies the perceiver of it here. And you can see it's just an implication. There's been a separating out from this whole field of awareness that includes all the people in this room and the walls and the objects and all of that. Suddenly there is a separating out. There's a figure that emerges against the ground and it becomes more important. And it implies the perceiver of the figure here. And we've got this journey that goes from there to here. If that's there, then this is here. The perceiver is here. And suddenly we have other and I. Now, if you don't do anything more, it'll just evaporate. And then you're back to nowhere just this open space. But I doesn't like that. I wants to survive, as we know that I does. So what I does is it reaches out to make a relationship with the other, and it reaches out and it wants to know, is that other for me, against me, or neutral? And that's the second development in this story of ego, the story of I, confusion, which is, it's called feeling that there is a feeling to everything in our relationships. You can't walk down and step out onto the street without thinking, is this a good day or a bad day? Or an indifferent day? Do I like the, the scenery on this street? Does it irritate me or am I indifferent to it? These are the three poisons. They're at the center of the wheel of life, the chicken, the pig, and the snake. The pig represents indifference. The, the rooster, it's actually a rooster, represents passion and the snake represents aggression because as soon as we have a feeling about the other, if it's negative, if we feel that that other is against us, then we have aggression. We want to push it away, distance ourselves. If we feel that it's for us, then we want to pull it towards us, which is passion. And if we don't care, if we don't think that that thing has an implication one way or the other, then we remain indifferent, which is those are the three poisons right there. So as soon as you have a, a dualistic relationship of I and other, you've got these three possible relationships, aggression, passion, or neutrality, indifference. And those are the snake, aggression, the rooster, passion, and the pig, for indifference, neutrality, sloth, whatever you want to call it. And then if, let's say the thing is for us, then you want to pull it to you. That's the third development in the story. That's called samjna in Sanskrit, it means conception. But basically what it means is that if it's for us, we want to pull it to us. We don't just feel it. Now we're doing something with it. We're, we're a pull, pushing, pulling it towards us. Or if it's negative, if it's, a, if it's inimical to our well-being, then we want to get rid of it. We want to distance ourselves. And if it's indifferent, then we stay the same difference. So this is the third one. The first one is just the birth of the dualism, I and other. The second one is you feel the quality of other and determine is it for me, against me, or neutral. And the third one is, having made that determination, you either pull it towards you, push it away from you, or stay the same dif distance. Those are the only three possibilities for two things. And I like to say, you know, that uh, an infant, a child, a, a human being is born at about this level of the development of ego. Infants are on automatic. They're just pushing and pulling and remaining indifferent. You know, if, if it's something pleasurable, they are happy. If it's something painful, they cry. And if they're indifferent, they just do gurgle or whatever <laughs> the baby does. And they don't really have any, a very more sophisticated um, method of operation. 
But as the child, as the infant grows and turns into a toddler, they begin to learn how to classify things. So, you know, I remember when my first daughter was toddling and just learning language, and uh, we taught her the stove is hot. And she would look at the stove and point to it and say, hot, hot, you know. Or, or, you know, mama, dada, bottle, all those things that babies learn. And they're beginning to learn how to classify. Now the stove isn't always hot, right? It doesn't work very well. It's, it's, it's sort of crude. It's very clumsy what a person learns in the first blush of learning language. But it's the beginning of a system of classification. And this is the third and the fourth development. The fourth one is called samskara, uh, which is translated as karmic action or um, collections. And as the child grows, they become more and more sophisticated and they can, they can say sometimes the stove is hot and sometimes the stove is cold, you know. Mommy's happy and mommy's not happy or whatever, you know, all kinds of subtleties that uh, develop in language for the purpose of more accurately classifying the relationships that we have with the world so that we can maximize our feeling of pleasure and minimize our feeling of pain or maximize our sense of well-being and minimize our sense of threat and death. And this is all part of sort of an ongoing story. It stops all the time. As soon as a person comes present, the story evaporates but then they come back to it. It has an ongoing momentum. And especially in this fourth level, this is the fourth skanda, it's called samskara, we begin to develop very, very sophisticated stories about the world. And these stories contain lessons in how we should behave. And really these stories that we begin to develop about our world and ourselves are the stuff of karma because we tend to repeat them over and over and over again and to find ourselves bound into them habitually. And because we see, we are seeing the world through the lens of this particular story. So the, um, an example that I um, dreamt up a, a long time ago is of a mother who's walking down the street with her child and uh, she's distracted and she's looking in the windows of stores and the child sees a dog and doesn't know dogs, uh, but is curious and goes up to this dog and the dog bites the child. Traumatic incident. Mother rescues the child, the dog's taken away. And over time, the child forgets about that traumatic incident. They stop crying and go on to other things. But the memory of it is stored in what in Freudian terms we call the unconscious. In, uh, in Buddhist psychology, they call it the storehouse consciousness, the alaya, the alaya vijnana. So then maybe a few months later, the child's walking down the street again with its mother. And once again, she's distracted and the child sees a dog again in the distance and is immediately frightened because it, it brings up that past memory this is how karma works. This is karma. And it has a reaction, wants to run away based on the previous story of what happened. And the mother sees what's going on and she approaches the owner of the dog, determines it's a friendly dog, brokers a meeting between the child and the dog. The dog is friendly. It licks the child's face, wags its tail. And the child learns that this dog is a friendly dog and that not all dogs bite, and some dogs are friendly. And that memory is now stored in the alia and will condition the next time, the, the, the child's response and behavior, the next time, the third time the child meets the dog, won't, you know, won't assume that the dog's aggressive. And this is the rolling forward of karma that takes place at the fourth development. And then finally in the last development, things get really confused. Because what happens is you get the energy of the third skanda, which is the push-pull of passion you know, and aggression and indifference. 
this energy of how we relate with other. And we have the stories now that we have begun to develop in the fourth skanda. And the energy gets mixed with the concept. It's like uh, a mixing colors of paint. And we get full-blown stories, very complex, erratic stories that take place in our minds in fragments or in, in whole. And these are called the realms, the six realms. And they are mixtures of concept and energy. The energy you might call emotion. In the traditional Buddhist language, they call it defilement, klesha. And so tonight, I just wanted to quickly, maybe not quite so quickly, but go through these six realms because they're really wonderful. They're a terrific teaching. The six realms are, just to get, put them on the table, going from top to bottom, although there's no particular order to the way in which we might experience them. The god realm at the top, the realm of the demigods, or sometimes called jealous gods, right below that. Below that is the human realm, and these are the top three realms. On the wheel of life, they uh, inhabit the top of the wheel. The god realm is in the middle, the uh, demigods or jealous gods are to your right as you look at the wheel, and the human realm is to the left. One, two, three. The bottom half are the lower realms, and these you would like to avoid, if, but you can't. You will experience them. In the center at the bottom is the hell realm. It's the absolute worst. Over on the right, to your right, viewer's right, is the realm of the hungry ghosts. And over on the left is the animal realm. And these are called the three lower realms. Now, a person can inhabit these realms in one of roughly three ways. So for instance, everybody in this room is, was born into the human realm. We all have human bodies. If anybody brought their dog with us, then we'd have a member of the uh, animal realm here. The other realms you can believe in or not, um, because they're disembodied in the normal sense. The hell realm, the um, realm of the hungry ghosts, the uh, jealous god realm, and the god realm. They, um, all of these realms then have a, a second dimension besides the purely physical or birth dimension. And that is that you can be a human being, but have the mentality of a jealous God. And that mentality can endure for varying periods of time, even for your whole life. And you can go through the, this life behaving like a jealous God with the body of a human being. And we're gonna come back to what these portraits look like. And then finally, the third level is that from, for some shorter period of time, each one of us, in fact, any of the denizens of these realms, can inhabit another realm. So you might get totally freaked out, afraid for your utter well-being, panicked, full of hatred and aggression towards the threat, and you are having a flash of the hell realm. Or somebody gives you a million bucks, or a big kiss on the cheek, and you feel intense pleasure for a moment, and you are in the, the God realm. So these three sort of ways. Now, these the third way, that sort of instantaneous experience, that can go, go on for any period of time. It could be just a flash. It could be for minutes. It could be for hours, days, weeks, months. If it goes on for years, then you're probably at the second level where you've sort of got an ongoing neurotic style. No. So what are these realms? They're portraits of neurotic, samsaric, unenlightened mind. The God realm is the realm of pleasure. Gods are characterized by thinking they've got it made, whatever it is. It doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor, although it's a lot easier to be rich and think you've got it made. But a lot, there are a lot of rich people who live in the hell realm. 
you know, people who commit suicide, we know them. There are no rules about it. So the basic characteristic of the God realm is you think that you have arrived in the, re in the land of pleasure. And they say of gods that everything they see is beautiful, everything they hear is music, everything they smell is perfume, everything they eat is ambrosia. And they make love with a glance instead of the messy way that human beings have to do it. So it's this realm of extreme pleasure. But there's a quality of stupidity in the God realm. It's sort of the Marie Antoinette problem. Let them eat cake. You know? Gods can't really sympathize or uh, empathize with human beings because they're so absorbed in pleasure. And perhaps you've met people like this or experienced it yourself you know, for some period of time, a fleeting period of time, maybe not so fleeting, who knows. And gods, <clears throat> in particular, in the back of their minds, they know that it's temporary, like all things, because everything's temporary. So in the back of a god's mind is the knowledge that sooner or later, they're going to fall from heaven. And the closer they get to that fall, the more frightening it is, because the fall from heaven is very, very painful. You lose everything that you loved, you know, that you enjoyed, that was the source of your pleasure, security, happiness, long life, health, wealth, love, whatever it might be. And so the descent from the God realm is very fraught with pain. Uh, and it's not a pleasurable thing. Now below the god realm is the realm of the jealous gods or the asuras in Sanskrit. They're also called demigods or asura literally means not god. But they are gods. They're just not the gods. And they live over on the right side of the wheel of life. And they're depicted, you can see one of them is reaching up. There's a tree that grows in the realm of the asuras and it's bearing fruit. And they're reaching and they're trying to get the fruit. But the fruit is on the other side of the wall. It's in the God realm and only the gods can pick it. <laughs> so the Asuras are really pissed. You know, the trees in their in their realm and they grew it. They nurtured it. They watered it. But the gods are enjoying the fruit. You know, it's kind of like uh, developed countries living off the backs of third world labor. So the Asuras are really angry and they want to attack the God realm. And the Asuras are, they're very smart, very smart. They're warriors. And they're constantly being killed. They're constantly being wounded by the gods because the gods are stronger and bigger. And they are attacking. They are trying to breach the walls. They want to get into heaven. And I think of this as uh, people that I've known uh, for instance, on in the financial sector, you know, people who inhabit uh, venture capital firms and private equity firms and Wall Street uh, brokerage houses and banking houses, and who have this desire for money, and the people who haven't quite made it yet, you know, they see the people who have made it, the partners at Goldman Sachs, and they're the asuras. They're storming the gates of heaven. They want to become a partner. And they're smart, they're tough, they're hardworking, and they're dangerous. But they're, you find them in all, all walks of life, asuras. You can find them in the art world even, in the spiritual world even. <laughs> Anybody who's got ambition, wants to make it into the God realm and be, and, and reap the fruits of success So coming down from that uh, is the human realm. And the human realm is the realm of um, passion. Oh, there's an, a, um, a klesha, a defilement, you might say, a, and a key emotion associated with each realm. The key emotion that's uh, um, associated with the God realm is pride. It's complete self-absorption and pride. And the 
um, emotion, the defilement that's connected with the jealous God realm is jealousy, envy. They want what someone else has got. Is that the Asuras? That's the Asuras, right. The not gods, the wannabe gods. The humans, this is the realm of passion. It's the realm of uh, connoisseurship, you might say. It's the realm of trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. It's like, I'd like my Chateaubriand just, you know, uh, medium rare. <laughs> not rare, not medium, just medium rare. I'd like that Chateau Lafitte uh, 59, you know, with my Chateaubriand, <laughs> whatever it is. You know, we're fine-tuning pleasure at whatever level we we take it. And um, the virtue of the human realm is just that, that it's very intelligent. And uh, you can, um, you've got just enough pain to motivate a human being to tread the spiritual path and just enough surcease from pain, you know, escape from pain, that they're not like the hell beings are going to be when we get to there, where they're totally consumed and obsessed with the pain. So they've actually, so human beings have the sort of the space, the psychic space in which to tread the path and work on themselves, but they've got enough motivation and enough unhappiness to want to do it. None of the other realms do. None of the other realms are suitable for treading the, the path to enlightenment. In the other realms, you can move along the path. But you do it not by virtue of your intention or your will. You do it by virtue of your karma, wearing out karma. You do it willy-nilly, the, the animals, the gods, the jealous gods, because they don't have enough, the right combination of pain and space to make the decision to tread the path. And so they don't. Nonetheless, they will evolve and eventually they'll become human beings and then they have the option or the opportunity to begin to attack the problem fundamentally. So humans, um, if you get into the more esoteric tantric teachings, they give you other reasons why only humans can tread the path. And they have to do with uh, the equipment that's built into the human body, having to do with chakras and channels and prana, the winds that move through the body and bindu, which the other denizens of the other realms simply don't have. They don't have a, the right collection. But I think the main uh, way in which you can understand it is really in terms of motivation. That as human beings, we have enough leisure and enough suffering and enough sanity that we can actually tackle the problem fundamentally. And although most don't. A handful of people actually tread the path. So below the human beings, the, the next realm down, and this is where these are the realms you really don't like to be in, although We've all been in them, either psychically or if you believe in rebirth, we've lived through them. And the next one down is the animal realm. And the animal realm, the problem for the animals is that they're really stupid. Um, they're not so much unintelligent as they are fixated on a very limited number of things. So they can't really look right or left. They're just sort of looking at what's in front of, their, in front of them. It's like a dog, you know, I mean, a dog only has a very limited range of response to the phenomenal world, you know, jumps on it, licks it, barks it, pees on it, um, tries to fuck it, eats it, eats it. And beyond that, I mean, you don't, you don't see a dog appreciating one fine wine over another or looking at Picasso's uh, <laughs> at the MoMA because they, they are fixated on a very, very limited range of stimuli and they're seeking pleasure in pursuing those stimuli and of trying to avoid pain. And the problem for animals as well 
is that they are at the mercy of other sentient beings, especially humans. So they are being victimized much more than the denizens of other realms, of the other, of the higher realms. And then below the owl and the, um, the klesha, the defilement motion of the animal realm is stupidity. And then below that you have the hungry ghosts and you've met hungry ghosts. Uh, hungry ghosts are beings who are hungry. They just have an unreasonable hunger of one kind or another. Could be a hunger for money, could be a hunger for love, could be a hunger for friendship, it could be a hunger for who knows what. And that hunger is insatiable. It can't be sated. Hungry ghosts, there are many, many kinds of hungry ghosts. But the classic hungry ghost is depicted as this being that has an enormous belly, a teeny little neck, and a teeny little mouth. And the idea is that they've got this enormous belly that wants to be filled, but they can only get one drop of honey or one grain of rice down through that mouth. And when it enters the mouth, there are chemicals in the mouth that make it burn. So <laughs> it's just totally un unsatisfying and unpleasant. I remember a, a guy that I knew in when I was in college and um, he was a friend, but um, I always felt about him and so did everyone else that he was so hungry for friendship that it made it difficult to be with him. Perhaps you've known people like that. You know, there's just sort of a bottomless pit of um, need, neediness. So hungry ghosts are consumed by hunger. And that's their klesha, is constant feeling of poverty. They see themselves as, as beggars at the banquet of, the, of life. And it's very painful kind of existence. And finally, the sixth realm is the hell realm. And um, this, the passion of the hell realm is um, the, the defilement, the emotion, is aggression, hatred. Because hell beings feel that their very existence is threatened in one way or another. Whatever their, however you define that threat in your existence, it could be Someone's taking away your lover. Could be that you're going to lose your money, that uh, or you've lost your money. Could be that uh, your sanity is being attacked. Could be your physical well-being. Whatever it might be, there's huge loss, huge threat. They say that you know the the hells. There are two kinds of hells: uh, the hot hells and the cold hells. Eight of eight, eight of each. And. Um, then there, are what are, then there are another, I forget how many ancillary hells. Anybody remember? No? You don't want to know. <laughs> the ancillary hells are sort of deceptive. It's like you might get out of one of the, say, the hot hell. You might finally wear out your karma, and you think you've gotten out of the hot hell. And the example of an ancillary hell is that you were burning, burning for eons, and now suddenly you, it's, you know, you managed to escape that terrible heat and burning sensation, and you see this lake, and it's a cool lake, and you're going to, you jump into this lake expecting pleasure, and it's full of rotting corpses. <laughs> That's an ancillary hell. <laughs> That's the example <laughs> that um, one writer gave, the Dalai Lama, in fact. <laughs> He's got a terrific book on this. I mean, his book isn't so good on the realms. For the realms, I would recommend even better than The Profound Treasury is uh, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. There's a terrific discussion of the realms in Cutting Through. Uh, but um, for the Nidanas, the Dalai Lama has a book on, uh, it's called The Wheel of Life. 
and he does a really amazing job on, on the Twelve Nadanas. So the Hell Realms are really, really painful. And you've seen human beings who are inhabiting the Hell Realms. You know, walking down the street, uh, screaming, um, talking to themselves um, out of their minds, uh, in extraordinary pain and fear. And it's very hard to escape. The Hell Realms are very long, and it's a big, it's a moot point whether they actu actually endure for long periods of time or whether it just seems that way because time is just another conception of confused mind. It doesn't actually exist. It's just a, an idea. And you know how time expands and contracts. If you're having a great time, it goes fast. And if you're having a bad time, it goes slowly. And the older we get, we look back on our lives and it just went like that because it doesn't really exist. Just a story. Another story we tell ourselves. So the hell realms are very painful. And again, there are these three ways that you can inhabit the realms. You can be born into it. So, you know, once you um, begin to sort of accept the probability, let's say, or the likelihood that in fact there is such a thing as rebirth, then there's the idea that you could be, you could die as a human being and be reborn in the hell realm or the hungry ghost realm. You don't want to do that. <laughs> and there are all kinds of stories about how that happens and what you can do to avoid it <clears throat> in the bardo, the time between physical death and re physical rebirth. So, you know, I heard um, Trungpa Rinpoche once giving a seminar early days, first year I'd met him. And it, on death. And he was talking about rebirth. And I'll just leave you with this thought because it's, uh, it's informed my understanding for 50 years now almost. And um, he was making the distinction between the idea of reincarnation and rebirth. And as Buddhists, we don't subscribe to the idea of reincarnation. Reincarnation is the idea that there is an eternal soul that is unchanging and undying, which reincarnates. Incarnates means it takes a new body. The body dies and the soul goes on and finds a new body, on and on and on like that. But Buddhism says there is no such thing as a soul. There's just a continual process of death and birth, constant process of change, in which there's some continuity in the change, but nothing inheres, nothing endures or lasts. So as an example, you know, you can look at a photograph of yourself when you were six, and you can see the adult and the child and the child and the adult, right? You can see the similarities. And yet, there isn't a cell in your body now that was there then. It's all gone changed. So there's a continuity and an impermanence. So like a river flowing. And so that's why uh, as Buddhists we prefer the term rebirth rather than reincarnation. Incarnation means you take a new body and there's this eternal soul which Buddhists say doesn't exist. Just this constant sort of flowing forward of change. And um, he gave a talk about that. And during the Q&A, an old woman, <laughs> and I always think she's probably about, a, she was probably then as old as I am now. Because <laughs> I was about 25. And uh, she raised her hand and she uh, asked the question. She said, how do you know there's such a thing as rebirth? And of course, what we could all hear was that she wanted that's fine. She wanted um, reassurance that her physical death wasn't going to be the end. You know? And she said, so how do you know there's such a thing as rebirth? Remember dying, re being reborn, constant change? And Rinpoche answered, because it's always now. 
It's always now. And that amazing answer has stayed with me for 50 years. This is it. It's happening right now. And physical death at the end of our lives is just a grosser example of what we're experiencing in this very moment. As when we get up and have snacks and then this evening we'll die and we'll, our trip home will be born and then we'll arrive home and the trip home will die and the arrival home will be born and just a, there are a million gazillion infinite numbers of births and deaths wherever you want to point. It's always now. It's happening now. And physical death is just a grosser example. And we're constantly being reborn into different states of mind. When something bad happens, you can be born into the hell realm for some period of time. And we hope it's not going to be very long. Although for some people, I have a close friend who's going through it with her child. And the child is mentally ill. And there's no cure, no easy cure. It's been going on for years. The child's an adult now. And it's heartbreaking. Mental illness. And it happens. It happens. All kinds of things happen to us. So we can travel through the realms. We can experience the God realms. When you're jealous, you experience that, that feeling of jealousy. You're jealous of someone who's got more than you of something that you want. And then you're experiencing a taste of the jealous God realm. That feeling of desolate poverty, loneliness maybe, whatever it might be and you're in the hungry ghost realm, and it's heartbreaking. All kinds of things. So these are really extraordinary portraits, and lots of people write about them. They're, they're sort of archetypal, you know. There's n they, they don't have firm boundaries. You can blur from one into the next. But I think I'll stop there. Um, and I, th I, I do encourage you, take a look at Cutting Through and their other books as well. Um, I haven't looked at David Nickturn's book, but I know that uh, he wrote a book on the realms. Is it good? Yeah, Mike says it's good. Uh, he's a member of sort of our Buddhist world, and he wrote a book on the realms. Is it Awakening the Daydream? Is that the one? Or is is it the new one? No? Awake, awakening, awakening from, from the, the Dream? That's what okay. Mike says. Awakening from the Dream, David Nickter. So, any comments, questions, complaints? <laughs> Peter. Wait, wait, wait. You just, I think, uh, touched on this. It's on, it's on, Peter. Just hold, yes, it is. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, it, you just said this is the very last thing you said, and I wanted to go back to, you know, and sort of either say it again or add a little more, which uh, you hadn't said before, the fact that during our lifetime, we travel from realm to realm. We don't necessarily stay in the same realm. Um, and so that we, uh, we continue to manifest different aspects of the realm. I don't know, well, you could say people get stuck in the hell room. You know, maybe they spend more time there. Or the, uh, what happens is that people uh, who spend a lot of time in the God realm and are very so sure of themselves actually can go from the God realm into the hell realm. You know. um, so that, uh, uh, like, so if we're in the, go in the God realm, we're not necessarily so lucky uh, as to remain there. And in the hell realm, um, Rinpoche also talked about how you don't and do get out of it, which is kind of interesting. You don't what? You don't get out of the hell room, or you do get out of it. You do. Room. Uh, you don't get out of the hell room through struggling. They're struggling now. They're trying to get out. Yeah. You know, you're stuck. 
you do if you let a lot go and don't do anything much. Yeah. Correct? Right. Yeah. Because the hell realm is created in significant part by the intensity of your own hatred for whatever it is. And so when you relax that and uh, begin to let that hatred go, the heat mitigates and you then you begin to leave the hell realm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to finish by saying I've had experience of all of this. Of all the realms? I'm coming from personal experience, yes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, Alan. Oh, my Milos. Go ahead, go ahead, Milos. Mm -hmm. It's popular? Popular, right? I mean, well, I don't know about that, but okay. Let's see where you're going. There's a lot of people kind of there. Uh, because uh, it sounds like it's like addiction. Uh, it's like this constant need to be hmm. fulfilled or constant need to be maybe recognized, have that, you know, all the likes on the Facebook or the video. You know, like in, in a way, it's like needing desperate need for recognition. Is that correct? Could be neediness of anything. Yeah. Could be a neediness of food. Yeah. You know? It's possible. So I just want to ask you like you can go into that a little more. Hungry ghosts? I don't know. Anybody else want to elaborate on hungry ghosts? Um hungry ghosts are interesting. They um in the traditional language, they say, you know, that they are here, right in this room, now, and that they tend to live up in the corners, up there, and uh, they have whole colonies, you know, and they're as oblivious of us as we are of them. <laughs> now, these, but there are many kinds of hungry of hungry ghosts, pretas they're called. So, for instance, um, there are uh, celestial musicians called the Gandharvas. And um, at the end of the Heart Sutra, for those of you who know who the, who the Heart Sutra, you know, the, there's a mention of the Gandharvas. They're, they're hungry ghosts. They're pretas. You know. So they're all kinds. Makes an Alan. Alan's got one here, and then Rochelle. Um, for me, it's, it's most helpful not to think of the denizens of these realms is them, <laughs> you know. It's not they are hungry ghosts or they are living the animal. I mean, we all, as it's been said before, we all cycle through it. We all have our moments of hell. And I think what's, what's important for practitioners is to have some sense of the impermanence of that, that we're not stuck in, a, in our hellish frame of mind, that, that, that we do have a, an exit. We do have a way out through our practice as we cultivate some spaciousness of mind. And uh, we... This mic is against me. I'm going to get even to... <laughs> you you gave me a mic that doesn't work. Why is that? <laughs> you know, um I think the batteries must be dead in this. I've got some batteries in my bag wherever that bag is. Well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it is, uh, to expect that that's going to continue is is, uh, is inviting a whole other experience. So it's all it's almost like this is the point of view. It's all good. It's all good information. It's been there before, and it'll be there again. And now we get stuck in it. Agreed. And also that. Uh, whatever we experience in our practice is an opportunity to bring the mind of, of meditation to bear and on anything that arises like this. And it's just like when we're sitting here watching our breaths, the idea is that you, as soon as you realize that you're dreaming, you don't try and do anything to it. You just see it. And you take a, a non-judgmental attitude toward it. You know? And in doing that, you free yourself from it. So absolutely everything is grist for the, the mill of enlightenment. And um, I mean, there's slogans, you know, like the Lojong slogans that I, Alan and I and others in this room have studied where, you know, they say, um, that absolutely everything that you experience, you bring it to the path. No matter how frightening or depressing or unhappy it is, you bring it to awareness. As long as you're caught in the dream and sort of you're a dreamer, you know, you're treading the path of the dream, you know, walking, you're dream walking, then you can't do anything. You're, you're, you're locked in. And then as soon as you realize, oops, I was thinking, I'm dreaming, then you're not anymore. And you don't do anything with it. You don't judge it as being bad or good or anything like that. No matter what the dream was, it might have been a pleasant dream. It might have been a God dream, God realm dream. And you just see it, you let it go, and you come back to what's real, which is this present moment. And in practicing that, we are practicing our switching our loyalty, which is so hard to do, from the dreams to sanity. Or as Rinpoche said, from samsara to nirvana, from confusion to enlightenment. So we just see it, we let it go, and we come back to this, and we're switching our loyalty. The dreams are so entertaining, they're so gripping, even when they're painful. They're like watching a painful, you know, frightening movie, a horror movie. You can't stop. But that's the point, is to try and stop, see it, let it go, come back. Who said that? Oh, Brandon. Brand a tremendous amount of practice. Well, we've got all the time in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> it's always now. Right. Yeah. Oh. That's, the, that's almost the tongue twister of the whole journey, is, you know, tying together the experience on the cushion, the experience we're having here, the experience of understanding the realms, the experience of dreams, the experience of puncturing the dreams. And it all comes back to this simple thing of just relaxing into this. Into this, but it's, it's like the most elusive thing yeah. sometimes. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. This is true. Absolutely true. Rochelle wants, wants to say something. I wanted to say something about the hungry ghost. It's fine. Um, Hold it up close. The hungry ghost, which is addressing your question. Um, it's almost as though nothing is ever good enough. Uh, let's say you go out to dinner with someone and you both order exactly the same meals. And then you're looking, checking out the other person's food to see if they got more than you. 
See if they got what? More than you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> or the person that immediately takes their fork and goes across the table to taste your food first. <laughs> yeah, well, what that's... What was that, Milos? Oh, broke yeah. up with the girlfriend because of that. Yeah, um, and then when, and then when, let's say you have a a teacher and you both receive the same practice, you're always checking out to see who's out doing, like who's the better practitioner. So you just absolutely never have any confidence in just relaxing within yourself because you're always looking to see what someone else has because the poverty mentality how you feel about yourself is so low. You feel so bad that everyone else is doing better than you. And you can't even take it if someone has like a drink of water. Then you want that bottle. You want their water. And it's like agonizing being around people who are hungry ghosts because you feel you just don't even want to eat anything in front of them because they're going to grab it right out of your mouth. But However, what irritates us the most is usually where we are. Uh, and maybe we're just covering it up a little bit. So, I mean, I don't know. That's a really good one, The Hungry Ghost. Yeah, that's a really good one. And I think it's what you were saying is very prevalent in, in this day and age because Everyone is trying to outdo everyone else. Not that people haven't done that in the past, because I think that's always been the, the way. But um, I remember once uh, someone gave me a computer or something. I don't know. I had this computer, and I never, ever take my computer out of the house. But the one and only time I ever took it out, the minute I took it out of my bag, someone was like, ooing it, like looking at it like that was the only computer they'd ever seen. And I felt so, I felt so horrible. I was like, I'm never taking this computer out again because I can't stand it when people are looking at me and like um, wanting what I have. But then I have to think, how many times a day do I do that? The craving is just out of control. I think it's unfortunate mm -hmm. that the evil eye, like in Turkish culture or um, also Sicilian culture, there's an evil eye. You know, it's like the greedy eye, and that eye should not fall on children, you know, babies, or you know, it's sort of a a, a very um, powerfully negative energy mm -hmm. that comes from this sort of like greedy, you know. This eye that wants. So interesting. Yeah. yeah. Wants the phallus. Peter. Isn't it the 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 image of the hungry ghost is of a very fat belly and a very small head? Yeah. So that they can, they're never satisfied. They can't quite get things in and swallow and digest and so right. on and so on. Right. So this constant constant uh, frustration not fun but the thing to remember is that you, all of this can be cut through in an instant with the sword of prajna the sword of manjushri which just cuts through belief in i and other what is it yeah it just means coming back to the present moment hmm? it's wisdom yeah wisdom thank you Prajna means wisdom. And it just means coming back to the present moment and seeing the world as it is rather than as we hope or fear it to be. Just coming back. And we do it, we can do it any instant, any second. And that's the real action of meditation. So the meditation is that hmm? more, the meditation is that more available. It's it's available to us all the time. So it does make it more available. What? What makes it more available? Makes what more available? That we have the wisdom to do this Well, yeah, it's part and parcel of the meditation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah. 
But also the antidote for that is to um, practice of being happy for others. Yeah. Rejoicing for other people's prosperity or what they have. Just be very happy for others. And that cuts right through grasping. And for yourself. Mm -hmm. That can be really hard to be cheerful. Sometimes when one is really depressed, you know, um, and then to stand in front of the mirror and go <laughs> and just hold it for a while <laughs> and see what happens. <laughs> it's amazing how hard that can be. Mm -hmm. it, works. it does work, isn't it amazing? Yeah. It really is funny how if you put a smile on your face, it changes your mentality. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You know, and Trump Rinpoche used to say to us, he used to look out and he'd say, please cheer up. Please cheer up. He'd say it over and over again. <laughs> and it's really powerful to cheer yourself up and as well as others. It's hard. Sometimes, especially when you're in the grip of the hungry ghost or the hell realm mentality or even the jealous god mentality, you know, all of them. So another technique is to cheer someone else up and then, and then that would work. I think, I don't remember who said this, but the best way to make yourself feel better is to like, you know, uh, also entertain someone else or through comedy, you know, cheering someone else up can yeah. then eventually, because we're all connected now, yeah. it's like. Anybody want the? Well, maybe we should end here. Yeah. Okay. So um, we like to dedicate the merit. This is a Mahayana Buddhist practice. It means that you're giving away the benefit um, that you have gotten. And if you want to hold on to it, you don't have to do this chant if you don't want to give it away. But if you give it away, you get enlightened faster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you give it away, you get enlightened faster, though, right? <laughs> Although, if you give it away so that you can get enlightened faster, then you won't work. <laughs> okay. By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory.